I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my everyday life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Yesterday, we had a really popular video talking about the potential or the slight new changes to how the U.S. dollar is being handled here in Nicaragua. And this brought up some follow-on questions from people uh, about how the Cordoba works. And so I thought this was a great opportunity. One, because we're going to be doing the live stream later today. So I needed an opportunity to jump in and tell you there's going to be a live stream today on Thursday. So we normally start in kind of around 6 o'clock uh, central time, so in the U.S., uh, so if you are able to join the live stream, that's a great time to get on and ask questions in real time, meet other people from the community, and just have a really fun evening hanging out, watching the show, and talking to people. So please consider joining us for that. But it's also a really great opportunity to give some additional information about how the Cordoba works because it's a relatively unique uh, currency. And even if it's not completely unique or not something you're not used to, there's still some details about how it works that uh, are just very specific because it's its own currency. So. We're going to talk about how Nicaragua's Cordoba currency works right after that bump. Today's question comes in from Jumpin' Jehoshaphat, 1951. Now, uh, I'm just going to say he, but I don't know. Uh, he starts off with saying the Cordoba deprecates against the dollar. Before 2024, the official exchange rate was what's called a sliding peg. Uh, uh, so people with income in dollars like expats or folks receiving remittances got some relief from these adjustments. Okay, so let's start with uh, this this first bit. I want to clar clarify a few things here. So it is true that there's a thing called, uh, so there's a peg, right? This is where one currency is pegged against another. We're going to talk a little bit about pegs in general in a minute. But what, Nicar what Nicaragua has is not correctly called a sliding peg. That's not inaccurate, but it's not super precise. It is a sliding peg in a general category of things, but what they specifically have is called a creeping peg. And that uh, the difference is with a sliding peg, you assume that it can go both directions. And that's not the case with the Cordoba. The Cordoba is only legally authorized to move in one direction, and that is to increase the number of Cordobas that will uh, translate into the U.S. dollar. And it is pegged against the U.S. dollar. I think that was clear in the thing, but in case anyone is wondering. So the Cordoba is a reflection of the U.S. dollar in the general sense. So let's start with that. With the peg, the, the Nicaraguan Cordoba uh, has a set value against the U.S. dollar. So if the euro goes up and down, the Mexican peso goes up and down, those things will not affect the Cordoba. Only if the U.S. dollar goes up and down, the Nicaraguan Cordoba rides that increase or decrease with it, hence the term peg. And so that's an important thing to understand, that if you're working with U.S. dollars as a reference point, whether that's what your money is coming in or just how you're thinking about things, the Cordoba does not move versus the dollar. There is no like, oh, this is the exchange rate I got yesterday. Here's the exchange rate I get today. It doesn't work that way, except at the moment, and this requires a law and authorization and announcement. So this is not a, this is not a thing that happens overnight. It's not a thing that happens without people knowing. It isn't a surprise. It's all ahead of time, right? It's generally uh, marked out for years in advance. And if they want to change anything, they have to put out a big announcement, and let people know. And they're great about that. There's a real simple, <laughs> this is funny, but Instagram feeds you can follow that will keep you up to date on every change. Uh, and we have similar things, just to give you guys some idea of what it's like here. Uh, any change to the Cordoba is announced on an official Instagram feed. And it's, you know, just follow that. And there's not that much news. Um, and it'll tell you, oh, you know, we're, we're deciding, you know, to, uh, we're still going to do the proposed change on such and such a date, right? And here's what it'll result in. Okay, great. You have exactly that number, exactly the time. You don't have to wonder what's going on, uh, even out into the future. Same thing with gas prices. Gas prices are set because the government actually buys the fuel. You don't buy fuel from foreign entities individually, not very many places do actually, the government buys it and then sets a rate across the country. So the price of fuel everywhere, you don't have to jump from gas station to gas station uh, hunting around for better prices under normal circumstances. Everything's basically the same because the government sets the prices. They, they know how much everyone is paying for the fuel and they know how much everyone is buying for the resulting fuel at the gas station. So they have the set price and the same thing is announced in the same Instagram feed. They will say, you know, this month the price of gas is we see this most months, right? The price of gas is not changing uh, because, you know, we want to support the, the working families of Nicaragua 
or whatever. Otherwise, they would raise it and get more tax revenue or whatever, right? So, but when they do raise it, they'll say, okay, you know, the price of, of fuel has gone up. We have to raise the prices of gas. Here's what it's going to be starting on such and such a date. That way, you know to go fuel up ahead of that date and you know what the prices are going to be so that you know what to expect and you can hold people accountable. There's a lot of transparency and that's really nice. Not that other places don't have transparency, but they have systems that are less uh, able to be transparent because here so many of those things, being such a small place, they're able to control them centrally. Places like the U.S., just as an example, can't have reasonably the same price on the coast as it does in the Midwest because it has to ship things a lot farther to one or the other. There's just a lot of cost involved. But Nicaragua, whether you're shipping to the far point of Managua or way out in the country, San Juan del Sur or something, the actual difference in the cost of fuel because of shipping is pretty nominal. So they're able to keep that relatively flat. OK, so the that concept is important that we have this peg. It's very clear. It's very announced. Uh, and then what we have is a creeping peg. That means that over time, the amount of Cordobas you get per US dollar will change, but only in one direction. You will only get more Cordobas. That means that there is um, a, a additional uh, inflation on the Cordoba compared to the US dollar, but it's always more, never less. So if the US is experiencing, we'll say a 1% inflation over a period of years, that's 1% per year, which would be an incredibly low inflation rate. Nicaragua uh, has determined that the general inflation of the United States is a little bit too low for what Nicaragua feels is best for their economy. And so they tack on a very small additional amount, uh, which is a little bit less than 1% per year when you apply it out mathematically. Now, it's it's not an exact number and it they varies in time and they you know the central bank will change it as they see things uh, need to see fit uh, but that is what it is right they want to see a small amount because the US dollar typically inflates very little and most countries like to see a slight a slightly higher level of inflation than the US dollar provides most countries do this by having their own currency that is free floating and they will typically get higher inflation most places end up getting higher inflation than they want and are worried about bringing it back Nicaragua does not naturally see enough inflation and so they work to artificially enforce inflation to make sure that is happening. You can see all my videos about inflation and currency that explain why it is a complete farce for people to say you don't want inflation, why it's absolutely critical to the poor, and it is the uh, best means of taxing the rich versus the poor in general. We have lots of videos to talk about that, and this is just basic economics, you know, uh, but these are not things that normal people sit around thinking about. I come from a currency background. Inflation is a very important part of how things work. Hyperinflation, ex excessive inflation, these things are bad, but small amounts of inflation are very good. So Nicaragua's economists uh, look at the US dollar and say it's inflating well, but there's just this tiny bit of adjustment we would like to see every few years. We'd like to tweak it just a tiny bit, and that seems to keep Nicaragua on the course that it wants to be on. And so that's the way they've chosen to go. This is a relatively unique set of things. One, being tied to a foreign currency like this peg to the dollar, that's pretty unique. And two, that they have this creeping peg is a really interesting take on how to control inflation rates in a way that seems best for the country. So it's um, it, none of it is super exotic, but all of it is relatively unique. Now, it's important in adding precision to what Jumpin' Jehoshaphat said here. Uh, he, he said it that the Cordoba deprecates and then that there was a, a creeping peg. Well, that is true, but it makes much more sense to say it in reverse. The government has a creeping peg, therefore, ergo, the Cordoba deprecates against the dollar. The Cordoba only deprecates against the dollar because of the creeping peg. It is not the other way around. The creeping peg is not some attempt to reflect the changes of the Cordoba against the dollar. The Cordoba is on the free market, but because the central bank in Nicaragua is able to control it very strongly, meaning they're able to uh, produce more when they need to, take it off the market when they need to, uh, uh, have resources to back it up and so forth, the the uh, bank works, and we'll talk about this in pegs in a minute, works by controlling the inflation rate, not by controlling the Cordoba. Uh, so, or, or in many cases, that would be done by controlling the dollar. So the, the idea here is not that there is deprecation going on. It is that there is a set exchange rate and it, it, pe it, it creeps over time and therefore you're gonna get this deprecation. This is important to understand because it explains everything that's going on with the system. And I wanna go on to this part. So he says, uh, so people with income in dollars, like expats or remittances, got some relief from these adjustments. That is false. That is the, that is the first mistake. They are not getting a relief. They are 
simply able to predict what they're able to get. The Cordoba's rate is set by these adjustments, so there's no relief here. There's no you get more for your money or anything like that. It, it, it's, uh, um, this is the actual rate of the money, both its actual rate as stated by the government, that is certainly true, but it is also within really, really, really tiny percentage rates, the rate on the open market. Now, open markets have one rate for buying currency, one rate for selling currency. It's a little bit more complex than a single rate, but it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and for all intents and purposes, the rate is the rate. It will fluctuate just the tiniest bit on the open market, but essentially none because you can always exchange at the government rate. So there will never be a way to get more or less. There is no other value to the to the Cordoba, unlike a different currency, which we'll talk about in the pegs. So this is really important to understand that there is no relief. There's no advantage from the system from the perspective of someone who is getting dollars. If you are getting paid in Cordobas or you're being paid in dollars, you will see the exact same amount of money in value. And because the rate is uh, set by the government and there is a very consistent exchange rate, you are able to exchange in both directions forever and you will not gain or lose money except normally you have to pay for someone to do the exchange for you. How else do they make their money? Why would they bother doing it? So you will lose money by paying the person to do the exchange, but going back and forth is designed to be transparent. So you never have to worry what you're paid in. There's no possibility of advantage. The only time that you want to have one currency or another is under normal circumstances, Cordoba is more easy to use around the country because it's more granular, more widely available. You can you can just get more fresh bills anytime. You don't have to worry about tiny rips in the bills. You can go get new ones from a bank. Uh, they can they can destroy the old ones. Like they have processes to make this work because it's their currency. Like that's a big reason to print your own currency. So there's those kinds of advantages. And the one Cordoba coin and the five Cordoba bill are tiny, tiny instruments. So you can buy really small things with great granularity, which I don't think is really worth it. I would say really the five or the ten. Uh, Cordoba bill is small enough. That's all we really need. But they, ha they have these really tiny instruments. Here, the U.S. single dollar is the smallest U.S. currency that anyone will accept. No one is prepared to take nickels, dimes, quarters, things like that. So we have a less granular system with the dollar, but the actual dollars and, and Cordobas are exactly the same. Value, you just have this exchange rate, so you can go back and forth. So everything's transparent. You can pay for anything in either, and it doesn't give you an advantage. Except at the moment that the creeping peg changes. There is an advantage at that moment to shifting anything you currently have in Cordoba to dollars, waiting for the creeping peg to happen, and then changing it back to Cordoba because that's when the rate changes. But you have prediction on time to do that. So everybody in the country can do that should they want to. Anyone who's holding a significant amount of Cordoba great enough to benefit from that small additional uh, exchange rate value, which is normally a very small number that moves, and typically a number so small that it doesn't cover or doesn't significantly cover the cost of making an exchange. Meaning, if you have to pay 1% uh, of your, you know, you're going to exchange $100 worth of Cordoba into dollars, right? You got to pay 1%, you got to pay $1 to the money exchangers for bothering to do that for you, right? Because that's their job, that's how they put food on the table. And then you got to pay $1 to bring it back. You're going to spend $2. I don't know what the actual overhead is, but it's probably more than that. You spend two dollars to move money around. The that difference in the value of your of your cash needs to exceed two percent, two dollars. Right? And typically it does not, or very close to it where it's like, okay, I would out of $100, I would make 10 cents. I'm not gonna put in that kind of effort just for 10 cents. It doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> no pun intended. So that's the kind of thing. If you were in that position, if you knew the creep was going to come and your money was in dollars, wait until the creep happens and then exchange to Cordoba and you'll get that itty bitty advantage. But it's really small amounts at any given time. Um, and it really just highlights in general the risks of holding cash, which we talk about all the time. Like if you have money, it should be in things like stocks. It should be in things like uh, regular investments or something. If it's not liquidity that you need at that moment. If it's liquidity, then you don't really care about these exchange rates in this way. And if it's not liquidity, it shouldn't be in uh, in, in cash because that's always exposed to inflation and other risks. Uh, so you, you your real risk is not the Cordoba exchange rate. It's the inflation uh, or deprecation of your money that's happening while it's in U.S. dollars anyway. Okay, let's talk about those pegs. I want to give some examples of pegs around the world. 
Panama has a one-to-one -one peg. So I've lived in a lot of these countries or worked in a lot of these countries. So it gives me an opportunity to talk about currencies that I know a little bit about. So Panama has the Balboa. This is a currency that is pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the dollar and completely guaranteed. Uh, now, unlike El Salvador and Ecuador, which actually use the U.S. dollars and has no currency of their own, or El Salvador now has two outside currencies, U.S. dollar and Bitcoin, but basically they're just on the U.S. dollar. Bitcoin is essentially irrelevant there. Uh, in Ecuador, there is just the dollar. In Panama, they're on the dollar, except they use their own currency called the Balboa. So they're able to print their own, but they back it with dollars in theory one-to-one. -one. Is that actually done? We don't know. But I mean, someone may know. I have not looked into that. The uh, The theory is that they're buying every one of those things from uh, by, by stockpiling US, U.S. currency to have behind it. So however the U.S. currency fluctuates, it fluctuates. You can always exchange Balboas for dollars. And they only print certain things of their own, like coins. They don't have uh, their own bills in all denominations, right? They can, but they don't. So you often use dollars there and everyone accepts both completely transparency and transparently. But the Balboa is pegged, which means at some point they could release the peg. They just take the peg out. That's a theoretical thing. It's not a physical peg. And at which point there would be an open market for the Balboa and it could go up or down versus the dollar based on all kinds of economic factors. And then it would go wild and people would speculate and who knows what would happen. But as long as it's pegged, you're able to just exchange back and forth and use both transparently. So though, even though in theory, it's legal to have an open market for Balboas. And if you were a collector and said, well, I really want Balboas more than US currency, because I don't know, it's going to look cooler in a plaque on my wall. So I'm totally willing to spend a dollar five to get a Balboa because I just like the way it looks more. Then you have a fully legal open market where you can pay a slight bit more to make sure someone hands you a Balboa. That's fine. Totally legal. And for collectors, it totally makes sense, but it's only on a small scale. It's never going to shift the open market value. The value will always remain at $1 to $1 because you are guaranteed to be able to go to Panama and shift your money back and forth in a bank on the street anywhere one to one all the time. So, so there is no, there's no situation to create a fluctuating rate on the open market unless someone suddenly lost faith in the Balboa and believed it was going to collapse or believe that somehow they had $2 US for every $1 Balboa that they issued, right? Some crazy thing could create speculation and, and people could legally speculate and start paying more on the open market. But because uh, you could just go to Panama and exchange those back, that arbitrage would wipe that out really quickly. Anyone who made that mistake would basically lose all their money instantly uh, unless there was truly something coming that no one knew about and they shut down the open exchange. That's not going to happen. But that's the kind of thing that would require that. So that's the open markets exist when there's a reason to have arbitrage, when there's a reason for someone to want one currency over another and pay a premium for it. And it may be scarcity or uh, they believe it's holding a higher value than people have realized or whatever. And so that is where the arbitrage comes in. But in things that are pegged, arbitrage doesn't normally make any sense. So that's the Panamanian system. It is simply pegged one to one. They're fully transferable back and forth. So it is incredibly simple. Now, Let's look at Belize. Belize has a very different system. Now, first of all, they are truly pegged one to one, but they issue two Belizean dollars for every dollar. So we say it's two to one, but it's a full on peg. The value of the Belizean dollar 100% rides with the value of the US dollar. I need to keep moving my camera. Every few minutes, the sun comes out into a new spot because it's the morning and the sun's moving really quickly. So because Belize is completely pegged against the dollar, everything that happens to the dollar, good or bad, happens to Belize period, no exceptions. Now, people will sometimes get confused and say, well, you get better value for your dollar because you get one of those for every two Belizean dollars, but this is uh, one of those deep, myths about currency. There is no such uh, advantage. If you were to receive X amount of money in, in Mexican pesos and you needed to uh, transfer it to the US, maybe it gives you $100 in the US. If you transfer that same money to Belize, you get $200, right? If you transfer that money from Belize to the US, it turns into $100. If you transfer that money from the US into Belize, it turns into $200. Where you are determines the number you see, but it doesn't change how much the value is. The beer you're gonna buy in the US for $10 will be $20 in Belize because it's simply stating the same thing in a different value system. It does not have any actual change in what its value is, which is heavier, a pound of feathers, a pound of lead. They are the same weight. 
they are exactly the same. Which is heavier, one kilogram or 2.2 pounds? They're exactly the same, right? Just two different ways to state the same thing. That's all that's happening in Belize. Now, what's different in Belize than in Panama and some other places we're gonna look at is that Belize has uh, a closed market on the transfer of Belizean dollars, meaning, if there was a free market, and there is outside of Belize, a free market where you can uh, buy and sell Belizean dollars, they are worth, in the current state, quite a bit less than their peg would suggest. If you have two Belizean dollars, you will not get one US dollar outside of Belize. That exchange rate only exists in Belize. So while in Belize, everything is actually even more expensive than you realize because you feel like uh, you're seeing everything listed at simply two to one, but you are not. You're actually seeing it listed at like 2.2 to one or something like that, probably not that dramatic, but it is something like that. And so it makes everything seem cheaper. And this works really well for Belize because they're dealing with tourists. And some universal things about tourists is they're very confused by the raw numbers of exchange. They can't handle basic exchanges. and essentially no tourist will ever understand currencies. So the tourists who are looking at those uh, prices and stuff in Belize simply get confused and are willing to spend a lot more money simply because the whole system is too hard for them to understand. This is a very powerful mechanism that Belize is using and explains why basically they do everything that they do because their economy is essentially completely driven by tourism. Having this little bit of overspend mentality built into a psychological trick of their money is actually a brilliant tool. Anybody who actually cares can simply take out a calculator and run the, the calculation every time they go to do something and see what the real price is and make their, their mental determinations based on that in a proper way. But People don't want to do that, and so they just pay that extra little amount. It's not a huge amount. It's a few percentages, but those things go into the national coffers, and it helps create a stronger economy. So I think it's a good decision for them, and I understand more or less why they do it. I do think it carries a lot of overhead because their central bank has to have a lot of control, and they have to make sure that there is no um, um, free flow of U.S. dollars into the country or it would completely undermine the system. People would just switch to U.S. dollars that are stronger, and people would give a better rate for things in U.S. dollars because it's worth more. Uh, so they have to heavily restrict the U.S. dollar in, uh, in Belize. So if you're in Panama, you can use the U.S. dollar anytime, anywhere for anything 100%. When you're in Belize, US dollars are heavily restricted. You can only bring so many in. You can't get bank accounts in dollars. You can't uh, make payments in dollars without government permission. You have an unbelievable amount of control over banking and every action you want to do with the outside world has to be approved. So you have delays at best, complications at best. And in many cases, if you try to buy something from Amazon, for example, you could end up having that transaction denied because you're not allowed to use those US dollars to make the transaction. If you're buying it in Belizean dollars, you won't have a problem. But if you're trying to do any kind of foreign transaction that is originating from a Belizean bank, you've got problems uh, or complications at a minimum because the open market outside of the country will cause problems inside the country if it's allowed to interact in that way. So they have this, this opportunity. If you're going to be going to Belize, if you can get your Belizean dollars from outside the country, which is relatively hard because why are people taking Belizean dollars outside of the country in the first place. Uh, but if you're able to get them there, you're generally able to get a slight advantage on that rate. So this is a situation where an artificial value inside the country is creating an arbitrage situation. But they go to great lengths to curtail the ability to leverage that arbitrage. Because if you get Belizean dollars outside the country, they're useless until you bring them into Belize. And so there's very few people willing to take any kind of risks on the Belizean dollar because they simply can't use it broadly. Now, let's look at Argentina. Argentina has their own peso, and it is free-floating. It is not pegged to anything. So the peso has this value determined by the market. There's no government agency determining what the value of the peso is. The only valuation comes from the people who trade it back and forth. And so it varies from transaction to transaction. It varies from day to day. It's very unpredictable. This is a free market currency. And those carry some risks, right? So Argentina recently had some hyperinflation. Uh, we're talking a few years ago. And uh, really dramatic and really impacted the country. And the value of their currency plummeted because there was nothing to keep it in check. Whereas Belize has this banking system that, in theory, can hedge against massive uh, uh, falls with 
within their own economy, but would have no power to protect against falls from the U.S. economy. Uh, Panama would be completely exposed to the U.S. economy should the dollar actually go into free fall, but they have no ability to have their own uh, exchange rate impacted, right? So Panama never has to worry about something happening in Panama in devaluing their currency. But Argentina completely exposed when things get good, their currency goes up. Certain factors, good is a relative term, but their currency can go up in value or down in value based on market conditions um, and, and confidence. And so that has a separate power. That gives Argentina the ability to adjust to a lot of things, but also gives it exposure to a lot of things. But countries like Argentina are free to print more money so they can use that um, while that creates a lot of inflation. Uh, like the US, Argentina and the US are free floating and able to print money. And people tend to hate this because the rich really do want to convince the poor that this is a terrible thing because it is a very powerful mechanism for taxing the rich. It is a means of putting more money into the economy and having the currency reflect the overall value of the economy versus simply reflecting the value of the economy at the time the money was originally printed. It's a complex system. I'm not going to go into defending why printing money is the only logical way to have a free-floating system, but trust me, it is. But there are times that that will bite you, and the U.S., with its Recent inflation is actually an example of how we don't have to worry about printing money. If we actually study what happened in the U.S. economy, all the problems came from companies that are gouging, not problems that came from printing money. Printing money did cause a little bit of pain, but it solved a lot of problems that far outweighed the inflation that came after it by protecting the economy from going into collapse. Argentina is in a runaway collapse situation and printing money is not their problem. It is a problem, but not the problem. And they are now making a lot of uh, changes to correct things. And at least at the moment, they seem to be on a much healthier path. I don't know if it's a healthy path, but they're, they're in a place where they are improved from where they were. So these are getting into deep economic uh, theory topics, but currencies are impacted by these things and vice versa, they impact other things. So understanding Argentina is a completely free float, Panama is a complete lock, and Belize as an artificial peg without a creep, now we can talk about how Nicaragua is different. So how does all of this apply to the Nicaraguan Cordoba with its set peg against the US dollar with the creep? So like Belize, the value of the Cordoba is set against the dollar. It is not two to one, which is super handy in certain circumstances. So we appreciate places like Belize and Panama using really common numbers for things. But what Nicaragua does is they over time determine what is the best value for it and move it slightly. So the current value is very close to 37 Cordoba. It's 36 and some very large amount of change as the exchange rate. That is set and is just like Belize that you can go back and forth, but unlike Belize, they don't maintain it by restricting US dollars in the market. They do it by actually empowering the Cordoba to have that value. So by doing so, there is no way to have an open market because anyone who would go and buy Cordoba on the open market would be subject to the fact that they can always come with an unlimited amount of US dollars or Cordoba to Nicaragua and exchange at the official rate. So anyone buying for anything different than the rate would require either the buyer or the seller to be desperate and in a situation where they couldn't get to an official place to transfer money. So you're not going to get a better rate by going anywhere other than the official thing, which is the best rates in the country are the money exchangers who stand on the street. They give you the government rate with a tiny overhead for them because that's how they make their money. The banks will be slightly worse because they have more overhead and they, uh, they are the ones giving it to the people on the street, but in huge volume. Uh, so, so in theory, the banks get the best rate, but the banks don't pay pass it on to you unless you're moving millions of dollars all at once. So the, uh, the the value of going onto the open market is zero. There would be it would require a crazy person to give you a better rate for the money because it means they're voluntarily simply donating money to you. So while you may find a person who has a bunch of Cordoba and wants to dump it, and it's like you know what I'll, I'll lose a couple bucks just so I don't have to deal with having this Cordoba. Yes, a one-time transaction for a person who's overloaded with Cordoba and doesn't want to be could work in your favor, but to have a reliable means of doing this will not exist because the market simply dictates that it can't. Imagine a company that manufactures tables and the tables only cost a few cents to manufacture and they use scarcity to give them value. The first person comes and says, I think that table's worth $100, I'll give you $100. But then they take that table and since it's the only one out there, they'll say, well, you can't get another one, I'll sell it to you for 120. Someone might say, well, I really want that table, I'll pay 120 for that, even though you only paid 100, 
I don't have another means of getting one. So it inflates its value. That's great. But if you're the company that makes that table, you could always say, oh, someone else wants one? Well, if they're willing to pay $100, we'll create another table. And they can create enough tables to meet demand to create a situation where the table always remains at $100. And no one's going to pay $124 a used one as long as they can get a new one for uh, the same price for $100 immediately. And that's basically what's happening with the Cordoba is that if it starts to deflate, where it starts to gain value, the, the government, can, the central bank, can simply print more. I'm not saying they do this every day, but they have the power to print more and forcibly bring down its value to make sure people aren't seeing an additional value in the Cordoba. And since they will always buy your Cordoba back at the government rate, basically it guarantees that everyone's on the same page because it's an open market. Belize is only able to have that value that does not match the open market by restricting the use of dollars inside the market and making the Belizean dollar all but worthless outside the market. Nicaragua is completely open all the time, so there isn't any black market or alternative market where you're going to get a better or worse rate other than absolutely minuscule amounts that you would never notice. So that's important to understand. A lot of people confuse this with places like Argentina, where they have a lot of different rates depending on where you go. Like the government has one rate, the blue dollar has a different rate, street vendors have another rate, shops have another rate. That's not something happening in most countries, and it's certainly not happening in Nicaragua. In Nicaragua, there is a set rate. Uh, stores and, and businesses here inside the country must use that rate. So it's guaranteed as long as they're being legal, they're going to be on that rate. Uh, any banks, any street vendors, they have to be on that rate. A individual person, you with money, you can go out and do any exchange you want, but you'd either be taking advantage of someone who isn't very smart or you to be not very smart uh, to do that because there's no person who has a reason to move that currency in anything other than its official rate. So it's important to understand that, uh, that this is a true rate of the currency, but it's set by a creeping peg. Um, and it's also important that because of that, this concept that there's an advantage to people sending remittances or to people who are uh, getting uh, paid in dollars does not exist. That is a myth. Uh, that is one of those, you know, people just imagine that getting things in one currency then moving it to another has some advantage. It does not. It may have a convenience, right? A U.S. bank account cannot exist in Cordobas. So having a U.S. bank account in U.S. dollars allows you to one-to-one -one transfer those U.S. dollars into a U.S. dollar bank account here in Nicaragua. Absolutely. That's convenient. But it doesn't give you a monetary advantage. If you were to transfer that into Cordobas, you'd have the same amount in Cordobas as you would have had in dollars. The value of $100 or whatever, that's not going to fluctuate. So it's easy to get the feeling that you're getting some kind of advantage from the outside, but you are not. And remember, all the prices in the shops are locked together. So if you are uh, going through that creeping peg, all of the prices of things in the country modify with that. And so there isn't this advantage uh, to getting paid in dollars. Again, if you're holding dollars outside the country or holding dollars in dollars accounts, when the creep, excuse me, when the creeping peg happens, then you have that itty, itty bitty one time every few years advantage that is so minuscule, no one would reasonably ever notice. Maybe if you were holding a billion dollars in cash, but people with billions of dollars don't ever hold it in cash. That's just not a thing. So that should clear up a bunch. There's no reason as an outsider to really care about the creeping peg. This is all about export power in the country uh, and not about not about some advantage for remittances or anything like that. That completely does not exist. That is not not realistic. Now, the thing that he talks about is that Jumpin' Jehoshaphat mentions is that in 2024, uh, they froze the exchange rate. That's not exactly true. It's a peg. It's always frozen. You can't freeze a peg. What they did, and not in 2024, but a bit of time before that, was they looked at the U.S. dollar and said, oh, the U.S. dollar is because of the U.S. printing money during COVID, which again is fine. That's not, we're not, it's not a problem, but it created a situation where inflation was higher than they wanted. The Cordoba was artificially inflating or externally inflating because it's pegged to the dollar not frozen to the dollar, it is pegged to the dollar. Uh, and so the inflation is now higher than Nicaragua actually wanted. Normally it's lower, so they have to creep, but now it's higher. So in order to deal with this, they, they, they suspended the creeping peg that had been 
projected to take place during that time. They said, well, okay, we're not going to continue creeping because the U.S. dollar has inflated too much. We don't want to add additional inflation on top of that. But the U.S. dollar is not going to keep inflating indefinitely. It's just a momentary thing, maybe a couple years, and it's going to correct, and it may stay inflated. That's legit, but its inflation rate's going to come down to reasonable, and over time, we're going to catch up with where we had wanted to be, right? So the overall value of the Cordoba, like the overall value of the U.S. dollar, is currently a little bit lower than both countries wish it was. But in both cases, because they're locked together, they are moving towards where they project it makes sense to be. Once they get back on track, and the U.S. dollar is where it is wanting to be, then Nicaragua is expected to reimpose the creeping peg and go back to their standard system, but only once it's caught up. So the nice thing about the creeping peg is that when things are healthy, Nicaragua has a really good simple mechanism to maintain stability while still having a slightly higher inflation rate, very slightly, than the United States. But it also has a mechanism that it can suspend that creeping peg when necessary, and it's only the creep that is suspended. The peg is always in place uh, so that they can absorb overinflation in the United States, or what Nicaragua considers to be overinflation, right? They both have their own economists to make their own decisions independently. Uh, so it's not a frozen uh, system. That is a, that's a bad way to look at it. It is always pegged, which you could think of as frozen. And every so often, there's a tiny creep, not slide, because it's only one direction, still a slide, but a one directional slide, uh, to um, to uh, forcibly have this small amount of additional uh, uh, amount. So, but again, as an expat, you're not affected by this because they're changing the actual rate. It is not some advantage to remittances or anything. So as someone on the outside, you don't care about this. You you need to know the numbers and you need to know when it happens, but that's it. It, it what the actual number is has no variance for you. So he says, so the official rate penalizes folks with dollar income. That is not at all correct. That is 100% wrong. The official rate is the market rate at all times. So there's no possibility of penalization. And there's also no possibility of advantage. So the thing that there was no advantage to remittances, correct. There's also no, no penalty now, the same, right? That does not exist. My question is, is it pretty easy to get a non-official exchange rate from money changers? And the answer is no. We, that's what we talked about because this is the market. They're not creating a forced exchange rate. They are creating a market exchange rate. So there will never be because, and this is what proves that there's no remittance advantage and there's no current penalty. If those things were true, because there is an open market worldwide on the Nicaraguan Cordoba and on the US dollar, and that is the only thing we're talking about is their relationship to each other, that if there truly was any advantage or penalty, then that would be shown in an arbitrage number around the world in those exchanges, both here in Nicaragua, because you can freely trade at whatever rate you want as a private person, not as a bank, here in Nicaragua, and you can freely trade outside Nicaragua and because the Cordoba can be used anywhere that you want, I don't know why you would, but you can, just like the dollar can, uh, all these things show how real the price is and that there will never be an exchange where you can get an unofficial rate. That comes from Argentina, right? Argentina has an official rate that the government says and then a street rate that used to be wildly different now. It's still pretty different from a universal perspective. Uh, like if you're moving US dollars to Canadian dollars, no matter where you go, the rate's going to be really close. Some people are like, I'm not a money changer. I'm going to charge you extra because I'm annoyed at you. Yes, there's that kind of stuff. But if you're going to a bank or a street vendor or anyone who's like officially changing money, those rates are going to be really close because there's huge markets and that's the actual value of the dollars. And you can change them anywhere in the world for basically the same rate. If you couldn't instantly the arbitrage people in the Forex trading world would wipe out any of that advantage or disadvantage in a matter of quite literally milliseconds. They have systems that look for those discrepancies and trade based on them as fast as they can, which makes tiny amounts of money because they these systems look for this all the time. The moment that there is one penny of difference anywhere in the system, they go for that because that's how they make all their money. That is their entire industry. So anytime you hear someone talk about Forex trading or anything like that, that is using the arbitrage in these numbers to look for these discrepancies and they get wiped out so fast because as long as they exist, people will trade as fast as they can. So they, they literally can get wiped out in milliseconds. So you're not really going to find that 
um, except in places like Argentina where you have to do it physically on the street so the computers, the trading systems can't do it, um, or uh, places like Belize where the US dollar can't move in and out of the country so that the only way to change your money back and forth realistically is with uh, the banks going to money changers on the street is extremely difficult uh, and getting the dollars to and from them is super hard, uh, so it's it, they have to do all these restrictions. Nicaragua has none of those restrictions, so there is no alternative market, just logically. So um, I, I hope that that clears up for a lot of people. Idea one about how the currency just works, and two these ideas that places that have wildly different currency systems, little bits and pieces of their systems don't apply here. Um, all the logic does and all the freedom does and all that stuff, but each country has different types of mechanisms as to how their money works uh, and the things that create concepts like official and unofficial exchange rates in Argentina uh, do not apply to places like Panama, Ecuador, El Salvador, or Nicaragua who have free flow of the currency that you're talking about exchanging with. Now, if you're talking about exchanging to euros or Canadian dollars, those things float completely freely. And so you could find small discrepancies there, but they will remain very small because those countries have very stable exchange rates against the US dollar and that uh, near lock, it's still afloat, but it's a, it's a practical uh, uh, rubber banding effect that ties those currencies together due to the massive volume and frequent trading that goes on. So you don't find huge fluctuations, euros, Canadians, pounds, US dollars. They'll move compared to each other, but in very small amounts. Those things will all move against the Cordoba accordingly, but because you can always switch back to the Cordoba US hard link at the peg, you're not gonna find variances more than a penny here or there and only temporarily. Uh, thanks for joining me, like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. You can join our community, it should be right there. The little join button allows you to uh, commit to spending $5 a month uh, to be a member and it's really just a support uh, package. We do have a super secret uh, group for people to talk to each other, uh, kind of an insider group, but it, it's real minor. It's just a support thing, really. And uh, don't forget, we do have the live stream. Hopefully you're watching this on Thursday and there will be a live stream shortly after this. So definitely come check that out. And uh, if you have not watched the video about the situation with the change of dollar uh, exchanges here in Nicaragua that came out yesterday, be sure to go watch that because that uh, also shows a lot of the same misconceptions or, or the, the easy availability of misconceptions uh, because anytime you mention currency people have weird ideas about it so great to go watch that and see what's going on with that as well but definitely join us on the live stream ask your questions live scroll down ask questions here say hi uh, leave comments and I will see all of you tomorrow <laughs>